Hi guys, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us in this webinar. This is our first webinar actually. I'm Angela Arnante, your program officer for the Technology for Property Rights Project. All right, let's begin. It's already 10.05. So let's officially begin this webinar. Once again, I'm Angela Arnante. I'm the program officer of the Technology for Property Rights Project. And um, we're very happy that you're with us today. Um, we, we saw that uh, our, fit, our, fit, our participants come from various backgrounds. We have um, people from, the, from local government units, from the academe, from DNR offices. We also have private practitioners. And we also have um, students and some body entrepreneurs um, in the field of surveying. To officially begin, I would like to call our team leader, Mr. René Sanapo, to give us the opening remarks for this um, webinar. Good morning, everyone. Okay, once again, good morning to everybody. Yeah, um, I'm working with the Asia Foundation and the Foundation for Economic Freedom, and our work is basically on property rights and particularly on the policy side of property rights. So. The, the group that we have worked with in the Foundation for, in, for Economic Freedom include attorney Erwin Chamson, who used to be director of the Land Management Bureau and who worked on the, um, on the formulation of what came to be known as the Residential Free Patent Act. Um, in our work, we have noted the uh, problems that have, that have been encountered by people who wanted to get their lands titled and one of these problems is the cost and the duration of having their land surveyed. So we started looking for alternatives for, for applications of technology to help with this problem. And we bumped into a guy named um, Bokman and Walter Bokman and his son and a group called the Omidyar Foundation, or uh, which is now Place Fund, right? And they introduced us to a method of using drones for surveying. And we were fortunate enough that we have experts of the same caliber in this field in the University of the Philippines, Diliman, uh, I'm sorry, Genetic Engineering Department, uh, led by Sir Louis and uh, uh, Sir Blanco at that time. Right? And, and so we uh, supported work on this. And what came out was a land management circular about the recognition of, of the use of drones to support, to support surveying and a technical bulletin that details how you can actually use these drones for, to achieve a certain level of accuracy. And uh, much of this work was due to the efforts of Sir Louis and his team in UPGED. Uh, we also have two genetic engineers on our team in the Foundation for Economic Freedom. We have engineer uh, Rhea de Alca and engineer Bold Stila. And they also contributed a lot to this. Uh, much of the work that we have done is also because of, or, or we're successful because of the cooperation of local government units, uh, particularly the Agusan del Sur provincial government and the cooperation of the regional offices of the DNR. So without further ado, uh, we should dive into this interesting field about how we can use drones for, um, for various forms of surveying and in particular, our interest remains to be for property rights. Thank you very much, G. And uh, please uh, go on. Let's 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 get into this thing. Thank you for that, Sir Rene. Coming from the land of Cebu. Okay. Um, to official to start before we jump into the presentations, I'd like to call our director for project and administration of SES, Engineer Rielin De Alta, to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. So we have two speakers for today. Our first speaker, Ms. B. Marie Paola Rivera, is a research associate at the Surveying and Land Valuation Laboratory of the UP Training Center for Applied Geodesy and Photogrammetry. She is a licensed drone pilot. Her recent researches include um, projects that promote and utilize unmanned area systems or the UAS technology for land surveying and project monitoring in collaboration with government agencies and non-government organizations such as the Foundation for Economic Freedom. Our second speaker is Engineer Louis P. Balicanta. 
He is the current chair of the UP Department of Genetic Engineering and the director of the UP Training Center for Applied Geodesy and Photogrammetry. He is also a land surveying practitioner, faculty instructor, and researchers. His various research projects are in collaboration with several universities, national government agencies, local government units, and, and non-government organizations, which includes the Foundation for Economic Freedom. So I will turn over I will turn this over to Engineer Louis to give an overview of their presentations. Good morning, everyone. So this is the first out of several sessions that we will be having for the next several weeks. So the first part will include the introduction on the use of systems and probably different types of drones. So um, the first few slides will be discussed by geographer V. Marie Rivera. And then the latter part of the, the presentation will be discussed by yours truly. So with that, I will turn over the floor to geographer V. Marie uh, Rivera. Good morning, everyone. Good day and welcome to Do and Drones. I am V. Rivera and today, engineer Louis Balicante and I will be taking you through different drone classifications and some applications of the technology. We hope you enjoy and learn from what we have to share. So first, when we are talking about drones and surveying, there are two terms you'll often encounter, which are UAVs and UAS. Although these two are often used interchangeably. So first, uh, UAV and UASs. So UAV stands for um, unmanned aerial vehicles like this one. This is very familiar to us. It's a DJI Phantom 4 drone. It's a remotely controlled aircraft. Um, again, commonly known to us as drones. While its key difference to UASs or unmanned aerial systems, um, UASs are the drones plus every associated hardware and software. So this may include the remote controllers, the NSS base receivers, and flight planning PC. So now, what are the components of unmanned aerial systems? There are actually four, but um, newer technologies have five uh, components, which I updated and I'll discuss later. So first one, we have, of course, the drone. These are just two examples of um, a lot of drones. These are the, the drones are what actually flies around doing data collection uh, and image collection. So this is, the drones are equipped with onboard GPSs. Well, I must emphasize that while they are um, equipped with onboard GPS, these are, these GPS systems are just good for navigation. It means if you're doing land surveying projects, you might want to augment it with um, uh, GNSS observations. So the next one would be uh, the control station. This is basically the interface or the connection between the pilot and the UAV. So we're familiar with um, controllers. This is a Phantom 4 controller. You can see there is a mobile phone attached to the controller where you can monitor the drone's stats and the drone's location. So the control station displays the status of the UAV in flight. Not just mobile phones, you can actually connect um, tablets or you can install flight planning softwares in your laptop, in your computers. The one flashed on the right is actually installed in a laptop. It's EB, a fixed wing drone. That's e-motion uh, flight. It's flight planning software. So here, you can see here the drone stats. So you can see it's battery voltage, the flight time, you can do flight planning here. Um, you can see the current altitude at which the drone is currently flying. And of course, the drone's position. And most of all, it allows you to monitor the UAV while it flies out of sight. So usually, you can just use your controller without the monitoring device. But um, that's just good for uh, if your flights are within your line of sight. So. For instance, if you're going to do land surveying, most likely you're, you would have to fly your drones a kilometer away from you. You won't be able to monitor it. But 
with the control station and a monitoring device attached to it, you can see where drone is currently in. If its battery is low, uh, the flight speed, you can all monitor it from there. Now, that is just half of the data link. The control link makes up the other half. This is important because it enables the communication between the UAV and the control station. Um, most of the time, this is um, via radio frequency. So this one, uh, this is the radio antenna of SenseFly EV. It is connected to your laptop, which is also your flight planning software PC. Why is this very important? Because, again, if your UAV is far from you and it starts raining, well, actually, even if you can see it, it and it starts raining or you have an emergency, you have to send commands to the, to the drone. So because of the control link, you can do that and you could also transfer data. So for instance, it starts raining or the camera has uh, an error. It does not turn on, so you cannot gather imagery. Instead of finishing the entire 25-minute flight you have set uh, before launching the drone, you can actually call it back mid-flight so that you won't have to wait long. You can land it to the home waypoint and you can fix your camera. So that's the importance of control link. The fourth um, component is the payload. The payload is defined as the maximum weight the drone is capable of carrying. But most of the time, it also means the load itself or the sensors um, when we're talking about drone surveying. That means the cameras or whatever sensor you're using. There can be passive sensors and active sensors. So this is an example of a passive sensor. It, uh, it does not emit its own light source. It just captures uh, the illumination uh, using the illumination from natural light or the light there already is in the environment. Well, active sensors, much like this one, this is a LiDAR sensor, it emits light rays which bounce off the surface and back to the sensor so that it can record measurements. So now for the last component, this is um, the positioning station. Not all UASs have positioning station. This is relatively um, new. RTK and TTK capable UAVs have this. This is a GNSS ground-based station and it logs position of the UAV in flight. Um, as I said a while ago, most drones, they only have GPSs good for navigation only. But this one, it's closer to or at par with survey grade GNSS. It actually lessens the need to establish DCPs. So this one is a tarpaulin marker. So um, when we want to georeference our photos so we can make uh, maps, georeference your, your maps, we have to lay down markers which we could um, tag with coordinates later. So we have to observe this uh, with GNSS static observation. And later, we're going to put those coordinates in the um, image processing software. So with the use of um, the RTK and PTK corrections, you don't, you don't have to lay down that much ground markers. It actually lessens or completely erases the need for that. So this is just a brief overview of the flight process of unmanned aerial systems, especially for land surveys. So first, you have to generate a flight plan, put the area you want to survey, uh, and also put in the overlaps, the image overlaps. You can define them while flight planning. You can define the altitude at which the drone flies, and you can see how long one flight will take. So next is you upload the flight to the drone, then you can launch the drone. Now, the drone's position will be monitored through its um, onboard GPS. You can view it in your control station. And it, if it's an RTK or PTK capable drone, its position is logged through the GNSS base station on the ground. We go to the classifications of unmanned aerial vehicles. Actually, there is no standard yet for classifying this. but. Today, we're going to discuss 
three of them, uh, it is very important to know the classifications of um, UAVs so that you can choose which one would suit your projects best. So first, we have the technology type. We have fixed wings, single rotors, multi-rotors, and hybrid vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing. Then next is size. We have micro, mini, small, medium, and large. And finally, by range, which is very close, close, mid range, and endurance drones. So for the fixed wing, these are designed similarly to your conventional aircraft. Um, so the one on the left is the Trimble UX5, and the one on the right is the Sensefly E. Both are fixed wings. So you can see um, they are like planes. The wings do not move, except uh, you have a rotor at the back, which propels the, the, the aircraft. So these fixed wing drones are the ones you typically use for aerial mapping and topographical modeling. Um, however, uh, while the endurance is good, um, it requires a clear area for takeoff and landing. So you have to have a huge, uh, a large space or a wide area without any obstructions. So I'll show you here. This is UX5 launching, so it actually has a launcher. So that area should have no obstructions or else it might collide into um, trees, power cables. You can set that in the flight. You can arrange the its trajectory in the flight planning software, but still, you have to make sure there are no obstructions in front or over the launch area. So the next one is, this is a Sensefly EV landing. So this is a um, research partner. So you see, he caught the, the drone like a frisbee. Well, EV could actually withstand the impact, but we choose not to to let it hit the ground because it might um, smash against rocks. This ground is um, okay. It's sort of softer than concrete. So for farms, it can usually withstand the impact, but we opt to catch it anyway. So next is single rotors. These are designed similarly to helicopters with one big rotor on top and a tail rotor to control its heading. Though we do not count the tail rotor, so it's still a single rotor. It can carry heavier payloads such as slider sensors compared to fixed wings. So um, the good thing about this is um, since you just have one rotor, it consumes less energy compared to its multi-rotor counterparts. And also um, on a linear path, it's um, more steady than its uh, multi-rotor counterparts. Uh, this is a Vapor 55 UAV helicopter, by the way. And the other one is a lighter sensor. So next, we have multi-rotors. I think multi-rotors is one of the more familiar, uh, it's the model where we are more familiar with. So rotor crafts with two or more lift generating rotors. We have tricopters, quadcopters, hexacopters, octocopters, um, and by varying the speed of certain rotors, you can actually control the motion of the drone. So, for example, if the um, movement of the rotor is greater than uh, the drag, you can lift the, the vessel, and if it's less than, you can make it descend. So, also by controlling certain rotors, you can make it turn left or right move forward and backward. The advantage of multi-rotors is you can basically launch and land it anywhere. So unlike your fixed wing, which you require a vast open area for, for the launch and takeoff, you don't need that for uh, multi-rotors. So here is an example. This is a UCI Phantom 4 advanced landing. Oops.
See, it's very convenient. You don't even have to land it. You can just snatch it out of the air as long as it hovers in front of you. And finally, uh, we have vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing. So these combine the benefits of the multi-rotors and the fixed wing drones, which is really very useful as it transitions between two modes of flight. So it can, it will launch um, a la multi-rotor and fly like a fixed wing and then land again like a multi-rotor. So it has the ability to take off and land vertically without launchers or runways. So it's like this, it's, uh, this one is Joe UAV and this one is Wingfra 1. Um, these are um, units we were able to try and with, witness during our latest um, study with the Foundation for Economic Freedom last year. Um, Joe UAV is a unit of RASA surveying and Wingtra 1 is survey text. So as you can see here, it looks like a fixed wing, but it has rotors. So this is Rasa's unit. It takes off vertically, just like that. And then, well, um, when it goes to its um, destination or when it flies, it flies like a fixed wing. So it switches its mode of flight. Then when it lands, it lands vertically again. So you actually do not need a run runway or a gas space for landing. So this is a summary of um, the advantages and disadvantages of each type of drone. So fixed wings, they are long endurance and um, they could cover large areas. That's why they are good for aerial mapping. However, um, as I said before, you require a large space. So, and it's harder to fly. It's also harder to catch when landing. So that's the um, disadvantage of using fixed wings. So right now, in the Philippines, it's price range from 1 million to 6 million pesos. Single rotors could fly, could take off and land vertically and fly in a steady linear motion. However, it produces more vibration. So uh, I think when doing image capturing, that's, um, you could opt for a better, uh, better unit with multi-rotors when it comes to vibrations. And the larger blades is it just has one large blade on top. It poses more danger. It could, um, uh, you could hit cables because it has very large, very large blades. So you have to plan your flight carefully. So, and there are also no fail-safe uh, propellers in case that one rotor malfunctions. But still, it can carry heavier payload. So if maybe you want to um, do LiDAR survey, so this is the way to go, single rotors. Right now, we have units um, costing 3 million pesos. Uh, next is multi-rotor. Multi-rotors are one of the mo easier units to use. And of course, you can have it take off and land vertically. Also, you can control its camera and you can land it or launch it in a confined area. So very um, convenient. However, it has shorter flight times. So while, you, while there are units like the Matrix 600, you can actually load more batteries, but still it has shorter flight time compared to other units. And um, we have units costing from 86,000 to 3 million pesos. And finally, we have the vertical take of fixed wing hybrid, which have, again, the advantage of both multi-rotor and the fixed wing, or the vertical, the vehicles in fixed wing. So it is low endurance during flight, and it costs around 1.5 to 3 million pesos. So next we have um, the classifying drones by sizes. We have micro, mini, small, medium, and large. So for micro and mini, we have um, units like the DJI Mavic Mini. 
to it's just up to 50 centimeters in size. Um, small drones could range from 51 centimeters to 2 meters in size, and those include the um, UCI Phantom. Next is um, medium sized drones, which are 2 meters, which are from 2 meters to the size of a smaller uh, light aircraft, just like this Aeronamix R5. So it's quite big, but it's just a medium sized drone because the size of the large drone is much like the size of a small aircraft. Just like NASA's Global Hawk. So this one, it looks like it could um, accommodate a pilot, but it is actually an unmanned vehicle. It can fly up to 24 hours for um, close to 100 miles, I think. So this one is a large UAV. And finally, uh, we have the range and operating time. So this is very important, a very important factor to consider when um, choosing a drone for your project So and during your flight planning as well. So for very low or close range drones, you have uh, a maximum of 45 minutes operating time while close range up to 6 hours, short range 8 to 12 hours mid-range 12 to 24 hours, and endurance room could run up to 36 hours. So an example um, of this coming in, this factor coming into play is when we did a research with the Land Management Bureau, we have to survey a 400 hectare um, area in Giginto, Bulacan, in Inner Zagaray, Bulacan. So, um, if we know the operating time of each drone or each battery, each session, we could um, plan how many flights we have to divide the area so that we can schedule our operations efficiently. So, Van Dyen, Peter Van Dyenberg, um, he's the uh, director of or the president of the International Remotely Piloted uh, aircrafts. He devised this classification um, describing the drone size in this range. So micros can fly up to 100 meters and minis less than 1,000 meters. Um, the close range um, around 2,000 meters and so on and so forth. Well, you have your long endurance high altitude drones which could um, fly more than 20,000 meters uh, above. So there you have the classifications of the drones. So I now turn you to uh, Engineer Louis Balicanta for the applications. Okay. So I'll be discussing the applications portion of this presentation. So I'll be presenting the applications of drones. Um, there are different applications of the drones depending on the, the, the purpose or use of the, uh, let's say, the client or the user. So actually, the key here is the sensor or the payload that is attached. I will be giving you some of the applications, but probably there are a lot more applications than the one that I will be showing you. So maybe later we can discuss about this. Okay, the first uh, uh, very obvious uh, application of drones is for orthophoto mapping. So I think you have to click for the uh, images to, to be seen. Okay, um, orthophoto mapping is usual, was traditionally being done by large planes. But right now, due to the drone technology, okay, um, uh, normal surveyors like us can now do this uh, by having simple uh, like uh, uh, Phantom 4 no? and then we can do corridor mapping of uh, for example of certain areas so it is advantageous for drones to do this rather than a large plane especially if the project area is quite small so in relation for example to what we have in UP we have LiDAR sensors with the RGB attached sensor 
uh, we need actually to to fly wa well, at least uh, one square uh, 10 square kilometers no to be able to fly practically with the costs and everything but if you have for example a project that consists of only around 8 hectares probably uh, small scale drones is very applicable so in the photo here you can see for example that this uh, this uh, drone is used to provide orthophoto mapping for road construction design and uh, oh, basically road construction mapping and design later on okay uh, we have the so-called corridor mapping yeah, wherein we can actually provide uh, maps no, that are not, not that regular in shape. No? So for, for example, for large plains, no, you should cover an entire municipality or even larger. But with this, uh, we can cover small areas with the accuracy that we need. Okay, next slide, please. The next obvious application for us as mappers and surveyors is topographic mapping. Okay, so uh, okay. with the acquisition of images and with the uh, use of third-party softwares, uh, we can produce the so-called digital elevation maps or basically digital surface maps. No? So basically, we can produce these so-called digital surface models wherein um, all the, all the uh, pictures contained in a certain area is mapped, including the structures, the trees, and so on. Okay? Uh, from there, we can also produce digital elevation map, which only considers the bare, uh, bare earth. This will be discussed, but for now, I, I, I will also say immediately that this is also the limitation of uh, images uh, uh, wherein if the bare, uh, the ground or the bare earth cannot be seen in the image, we have uh, outputs that not that quite accurate in terms of elevation. So there are noises that cannot be easily removed if we cannot extrapolate, for example, the bare earth. Okay. Um, noted here in the slide is that uh, we need to provide lower flying heights to produce higher resolution outputs. Actually, there is a formula, drone, uh, don't drone and drone processing. Um, so the relationship between the sensor specifications and the flying heights are balanced for us to produce certain resolution or accuracy that we need you know, as a requirement by our clients. You can use other softwares like GIS softwares to produce topographic maps like contour maps you know, and digitize, for example, uh, certain earth features, built areas, and so on. Okay. Uh, this is one recent output of one of my advices, wherein we use an EB drone and uh, used a multispectral sensor as a payload to analyze and monitor the contents of nitrogen, for example, in this case, on a certain rice field. So in short, depending on the sensors that we will be providing, no, we can now do remote sensing activities okay, with higher uh, accuracy and precision because it's, uh, it's uh, for example, compared to satellite images, uh, the, the resolution is quite better okay, since we use a low-flying drone. So obviously, this cannot be achieved only by drone, but rather in combination with other techniques like GNSS and other validation techniques with regards to, for example, in this case, yeah, it's nitrogen content. So th this is quite, uh, 
uh, interesting and exciting since we can now map no uh, almost real time to do monitoring of crops at certain stages of its development okay, without buying for example high resolution satellite images okay so this is a, a good experiment probably we we are trying to, to market this, for example, to local government units and then the Department of Agriculture. Probably you can also support us with this. Uh, can we go back to the cadastral mapping part? Okay. Uh, as Angela mentioned a while ago, the Foundation for Economic Freedom, the Land Management Bureau, and then the UPTCAGP has initiated a research together with some foreign uh, consultant on the use of drones for land surveying or cadastral mapping. So this is quite interesting also since, for example, uh, decades ago in the 1960s, okay, our the pioneers in photogrammetry tried to do this, but they failed using uh, the technology then and then using large airplanes. But with the improvement in technology, improvement in sensor technology, and then the use of drones, we are able to achieve the required accuracy needed for us to delineate the property lines using images or ortho images obtained from drones. So based on the research that we, we will be discussing in much more detail next week, achieve less than 10 centimeters accurate, precise uh, digitization of the boundary lines from the images produced of, uh, for example, uh, low, cost, low cost drones. No? So the good thing about this is that this can be used, for example, by local government units in monitoring uh, development in certain areas, not just for parcel mapping, but also uh, building, construction of buildings, monitoring for uh, the purpose of the assessor's office so that they can know if, they, uh, if new developments are being done in their area and if the local people are really, for example, uh, declaring their properties correctly. No? So again, the advantage of this is that we can cover areas no, small enough for us to use drones, but large enough for the purpose that we need. Okay. Uh, other than this, we, we tried based uh, earlier, Ma'am V discussed about uh, our LMB research, uh, this figure, for example, came from that research. And then we, are, we were trying to integrate both uh, uh, the two-dimensional boundaries of a property with its third dimension, which is elevation. So the figure at the lower left shows a, pla uh, a figure wherein we overlaid on the produced DEM the boundaries of the property, okay? Uh, moving forward to the idea of having a certain property, not just have a two-dimensional technical description, but we can include the third dimension as part of its uh, description. Moving forward, uh, just to summarize everything you know, that we uh, probably discussed earlier, okay? These are the benefits of uh, uh, using drones. No? So first, we can access areas that we cannot readily access on foot. So for example, we have these hazardous sites and then in inaccessible infrastructures. Okay, I was not able to put in the slide, but actually we can use drones with uh, LiDAR sensors one of the research of our co-faculty and peer, Dr. Ariel Blanco, did uh, LiDAR acquisition using drones 
plants in mangrove areas. No? So that is one advantage. We can access those areas that we cannot readily access with the accuracy output that we, we probably need no? compared to um, other technology. Okay? Uh, third, probably, is that we can do large area surveying with shorter time span since we can cover larger areas. So, for example, with uh, the Phantom 4 that we have, no, we can actually cover around 8 hectares no, for that, that uh, cheap drone. No? For EB, for example, we were able to accomplish in one flight no, uh, around 16 hectares or even more. No? So, large areas can be sure. Uh, uh, surveyed in shorter periods of time. And then the flying height, we can produce high accuracy, high resolution maps uh, with the aid of uh, GNSS as an additional tool with several uh, strategically located uh, photo or, or ortho photo controls no? so that we can stitch this 400 hectare land out of the different 16 he hectare uh, flies, uh, flights. No? So Genesis is an important tool here. Okay, next. Um, aerial video and imagery, as well as the multispectral data that I've shown you, is another advantage of uh, using drones. And then, uh, finally, we can produce high resolution digital elevation models in combination with the, the so called ortho mosaics so what what is good with drones for example with regards to property survey as compared to using total station and using even using rtk gnss is that coordinates that we produce uh, from the survey this can be supplemented by an evident or evidence, which is the ortho mosaic or the ortho photo. So when we submit, we cannot readily do table survey anymore since the image will validate the property that we surveyed. So that's, I think, a good benefit of doing UAV survey for property uh, purposes, property or land survey uh, uses. Okay. So, uh, it is uh, UAV use for survey include efficient and fast uh, acquisition of data from the ground. No? Uh, with regards to processing, that is another story. But the overall time that you will be spending from data acquisition up to data processing is in general shortened no and data acquisition is quite expensive no compared comparing for example ground survey using ts or total station and gnss okay so that's part of cost effectiveness so you only need several people no i think with drones you only need at at, at least two or three or two Actually, you can do single person acquisition, but just to play safe with regards to monitoring the, the flight and then the one actually trying to look at the drone during the acquisition, you need at least two people. So manpower is lessened and then we can complete it quite faster compared to ground survey. Third is the uh, safety. No? Probably, uh, some surveyors may need to go to hazardous sites. One good example that I remember is that in the Southeast Asian Surveyors Congress, uh, one uh, presenter used drone to do indoor mapping of uh, mine, mining areas. So they used drones and uh, a LiDAR, LiDAR technology sensor to do mapping indoors and then to, to really map accurately the current status of the mine, mining areas. No? So, 
so closed mining areas. So we can actually do this with much more accuracy with the use of drones. And then accuracy here, it depends on the parameters being set. Okay, the more accurate that you need, probably uh, again with combination with the specific with the uh, specification of the drones, probably you may need to decrease the flying height further to achieve the result. No, although we are limited in terms of flying height by the policy set by uh, the CAAP, for example, the government agency that monitors this kind of activity. So accuracy basically is relative to the need of the user. Okay, but we can now achieve accurate results with the use of images produced from drones. Okay, limitations. Uh, just like other uh, surveying equipment, no, you have its own set of limitations. The first one is, okay, uh, to make our output uh, survey accurate, no, we may need to establish uh, ground control points. No? Depending on our specific purpose, the accuracy, we may have to provide more control points. We mentioned earlier that we can use drones with RTK capability. Yes, that is another alternative, but those equipment are quite expensive. So it may not be readily available to, uh, uh, let's say, ordinary users or ordinary surveyors that doesn't have that capability to buy these high-end drones. No? So control point establishment similar to traditional photogrammetry is still a requirement in drone survey. Okay. Another limitation is that overhead obstructions may cause erroneous elevation data. So in the lands mode research that we did last, I think a year ago, okay, we tried to survey urban and rural areas. And this is an example of an output in a an urban area wherein there is a uh, uh, power lines, no? power lines along the road. And then when we uh, process the DTM and eventually the digital, uh, the DSM and then the DTM, there's a spike in the elevation. So what we got, for example, are, are points no? from the power lines. No? So the only solution for this is first, if you know the area, okay, you may probably know that these are noises. Okay? Second, okay, if you are not familiar with the area and then you see this kind of outputs, probably you need to go back to the site and do some verification or validation survey. This is what I meant also when we do survey of areas with, uh, let's say, canopy of trees. No? So if we cannot readily provide information on the ground itself and we can only generate, for example, elevations out of the top of the trees, because the canopy is quite thick, no? we cannot readily produce uh, an accurate or good uh, digital elevation model wherein we, what we want is the ground elevation. So we must be able to supplement this with other techniques. No? So for example, some other techniques include going to the site and for example, measuring more or less the average height of the trees so that we can we can uh, put that in our uh, computations later on, subtracting the height of the trees so that we can have the ground elevation. So, for example, in, in, uh, as a summary on that, uh, no, what I meant is if we really want to get the ground elevation and then there are lots of obstructions, okay, this is another limitation of the drone since um, the elevations are obtained out of the optical okay, or the photogrammetric side 
of the uh, concepts or, or the the processes that we know. You know, unlike for example lidar technology, wherein probably the second and third return can probably hit uh, of the the laser signal can probably hit the ground of the project area. Okay, so okay, I think that's it. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I think uh, Ma'am Angela will be the one uh, mediating the questions. And okay, thank you, Sir Louis, for that uh, very informative and very helpful uh, presentation. In fact, we have so many. We have six questions now. So may I request the panelists to please um, help me in answering this one, these questions, and please do unmute your um, mics and if, feel free to, to answer or help me out in these questions. Okay, Sir Louie? Yes, yes. Meron pong tanong sa dito kanina about sa CTB points. So someone is asking. Um, I would just, I would just like to know if you're going. Okay, sorry guys. Um, we're officially opening the Q and A session. Okay. So Sir Louis, may tanong po dito. I would just yes, like yes. to know if you're going to issue certificates so we can use it as a self-directed learning to convert it to CPD points. Okay, of course. With uh, FEF, we will, we can, we can provide you with a certificate. Of attendance, sir? Of attendance and participation, probably. Participation. Okay. okay. Um, signed by people coming from FEF and the UPTC AGP. Okay. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, don't worry, we'll, uh, those who attended now, we're, we noted um, who you are. We will email the uh, certificate of attendance and participation. Um, either within the day or within the week, to be sure. Okay, I will dismiss this uh, question. Next, sir, uh, from our friend, Mr. Christian Clemeno. This was answered by V a while ago, but we just like to uh, not hear from you also. Have you already tested any DLOS aircraft? Uh, in the research with FEF, uh, we use the Joab, if I remember it right. Joab or something like that. Okay, so it was tested. And then the, the, what is the accuracy that we obtained? It's quite a, a, an expensive drone, right? It's an expensive drone. It achieved the, the accuracy, no? <laughs> what, is, what is good with, with that research is that we were able to compare different drones nga, with different, uh, let's say, costs and capabilities, no? And then one of it is the VTOL, okay? So we use that for, for a boundary delimitation also type of uh, activity. Yes, we were able to use uh, that. I, hello? I think I was, uh, I said a while ago na hindi pa siya nagamit kasi iba pa lang, ibang technology yung naisip ko. It was satellite. But yes, we were able to use that. And okay, sir, I think it was, was used in the research, right? If I remember. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Opo. Bale, satellite yung, BILOS satellite yung naisip ko kanina. No? Kaya sabi ko no. Pero for this okay. BILOS aircraft. So, tama, yung, may nagamit na tayo. No? We used opo. that, that BITOL. Um, I remember it in our yung, uh, processing. Um, for, the, for that study, I think we were um, aiming for a uh, 2 centimeter ground sampling distance. So, uh, yun yung ito target ng ating drone suppliers na ma-achieve. So, it depends uh, on, on the, set, the parameters they are going to set as long as baka 2 centimeters. So, yun. Just to make things straight, B, no? we use that in the research, right? Yes, A bit po, of yes. type of panahon. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, the, the next question is regarding getting higher resolution BEMs, how low is the low flying height that we should fly? Thanks. Yes. Uh, Vic, can, can you answer this? Yes. Um, so, as I've said, we're usually targeting 2 centimeters or better. So, 2 centimeters below 
uh, 1 to 2 centimeters GSD. So for this, uh, we usually fly at uh, 80 to 100 meters, 80 to 110 meters for, for us to achieve this um, accuracy. Okay, thank you, Bri. Um, okay. okay. Next question po dito. How are we going to gather object data from, from the ground and automatically classifying it? For example, building structures or three types. Uh, I think this one uh, you would have to... Um... Hello? Yes, sir. We can hear okay. you. So, with regards to this question, um, this is part of uh, actually remote sensing activities already. Eh? So, you can use, for example, different techniques uh, like, for example, uh, providing uh, samples for the classification. So, uh, I think Jujin is here. <laughs> I can see Jujin is here. Uh, probably, j just to have a safe answer, we can use uh, our usual remote sensing techniques to do this classification. Similar to what we are doing, so, yeah, we are still do doing the same thing, but now we acquire data using drones. Uh, just to expound on that, no? meaning um, you, you have to learn other remote sensing techniques. No? So drone acquisition is just a tool for acquiring it, but you may have to learn how to classify it. Okay? In short, probably you may need to do some uh, training center uh, courses, TC courses, or probably go to UP to do some masters, no? So there's no easy answer for that since it's quite very technical already. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, ito po, may mga iyo pa. Okay, next ito, question. Hmm. Ay, sabi dito ni Sir Leia Jean Solamo. Yeah. I am interested in land service temperature, sur land surface temperature mapping in an urban area. What tools can you recommend in acquiring data? Is it enough if I'm going to use Landsat data or do I still need to fly drone in my study area? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really not an expert on this. No? So there are remote sensing experts. Well, probably one uh, multispectral sensors, for example, can, can actually map out te uh, temperature changes or temperature or... Uh, temperature, spatial, uh, spatial locations of temperature on the ground or on the study area. So probably you can use uh, near infrared uh, sensors to do that. You know? With regards to other tools, probably I, I can I can give you, for example, names later on of those people from the department that do this kind of activity. So there are researchers, for example, wherein uh, some of our colleagues mapped out Manila or Metro Manila okay, during the lockdown period and then they found out that the temperature is quite uh, lower when there's a lockdown than the time wherein uh, I can help you uh, in uh, connecting to my colleagues that are into this kind of activities. Okay, the question from Jenny Silverio. Uh, okay, so for example, with the, with the uh, Phantom 4, as I mentioned earlier, okay, we can survey around 8 hectares for one flight. No? 8 hectares for one flight. No? So if you do topographic, so one flight is equivalent to around 20 to 30 minutes, or around 8 to 10 hectares as per servos. Okay, uh, you can do the flight for around 20 minutes out of that if you need to do topographic mapping. So if you do ground survey, even if you use GNSS, I think 8 hectares with the accuracy and then the internal need, okay, it can go at, at the lowest time of one day or even two days at a maximum. So that is a, the comparison. Okay. 
with regards to parcel yari survey or cadastra survey you can also uh, compare for example if you do go to the corners of the property one by one as versus you uh, and then you later digitize it no so with a phantom for that costs around 90,000 pesos during the time that we acquired it no compare it for example to their traditional techniques, it can be advantageous in terms of the area. So 8 to 10 hectares may be a good number using a low-cost drone. Okay? I hope that answers your question. Yes. Next sir, question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Will the process of producing auto-rectified images be discussed next week? Okay. Probably we can do that. Okay? I will be assisted or... My partner next week is Engineer uh, Severino Domingo Jr. So he's the one doing the ortho rectification of the images. So, yes, we will include that. Okay. Next. Can we use RGB cameras to obtain elevation? Yes, the typical camera or the typical sensor in producing elevation is an RGB camera. That's the usual um, uh, sensor that, uh, that is being used. Okay. So we use uh, different concepts and uh, equations, for example, in processing using that. I think we will be discussing that also next week, the, uh, the technique or that uh, uh, concept. And then the last question is, are there implemented guidelines already set by the board of GE on the use and accuracy of UAV drones for land property serving? Thank you. Okay, it's not actually the Board of GE, if I said it correctly, but rather the Land, Manage, uh, Land Management Bureau that is mandated by the government or by, by, by law to provide guidelines, uh, rules and guidelines in land surveying. Okay? But rest assured that during the research that we've conducted, no, LMB, UP, FEF, GEP is also there. No? GEP is also there. Okay? Uh, but we have to provide uh, trainings, additional trainings, okay? and uh, IEC is good so that the use of drones can be further enhanced. No? Later on, the, the policy, can be, uh, policy can be improved based on the problems that probably we can only see when we practice this much more regularly. Okay. I think in the chat or in the uh, chat, it was uh, provided by FEF, the, the memorandum uh, board, uh, LMB memorandum circular related to the use of drones. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Sir Louis, and thank you, everyone, for... Um for this question. Oh, okay, sir, may pa, ano pa? May pa habol? Uy. May isang pa habol. Have, do we have standard cost po regarding this kind of services? Okay, uh, to tell you honestly, I think Engineer Clemeno is here. Okay, <laughs> he is doing, and then Volts is also here. Uh, probably you can help me with this, but I think one of the advantage of using drones right now is that with regards to survey, we are still following the tataripa that was set by the GEP. No? Uh, and so with that, probably in terms of more lot more savings, since what is, what is prescribed on the taripa is use of uh, traditional technique. So with this drone, probably you may have to sh shell out certain capital money to buy it but in the long run, you can have certain levels of profit. So, uh, I think uh, if we don't have any time left, no, probably Volts can, can discuss that later on in the, uh, I think, the third or fourth session of the webinar. No? Kasi he has more experience in doing this. Ah, yeah. Sir Clement is uh, no, uh, acknowledging my comment related to having more profit. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you for everyone for these questions. Um, we're now closing the 
the Q&A session. So just a few reminders before kayo malis and before you have your lunch. Um, I will be, we will be launching a poll and we would, be really, we would really value your feedback. So here, I will give you a few minutes to answer them. Here we go. Um, okay, while uh, you, some of you are still uh, answering, while almost ang iba, tapos na, I uh, would just like to tell everyone uh, we're going to hold three more webinar series um, for in the next few weeks. So we're trying to hold this in a weekly basis until July. Um, later on within the day, we will post uh, the, the webinar topics for the, for the next weeks. And of course, if you have more quest if you have other questions na naisip nyo um, later on, please um, you can always uh, give us a message or shoot us a message in our PPR Facebook page. Please like it. Or you can always always email us in our technology in our tech for property rights at gmail.com. Okay, I will now end polling so that um, we can all go to our uh, lunches. Okay, in behalf of the Foundation for Economic Freedom, the UPDGE, UPTCAJP, and the the Asia Foundation. We thank you for joining us in our first webinar series and we look forward to having you again in our next sessions on drones for mapping, surveying, and securing your property rights. Thank you and have a good lunch. See you next time.